you have your Bibles, I would like to ask you to open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 6. We're going to start by just diving right into God's Word. And today in Luke chapter 6, we're going to be starting in verse 12. And when you find verse 12, I would like to inconvenience all who are able and ask if you would just stand as we read God's Word together. In these days, he, which is Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples, and a great multitude of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him, and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for the power came out from him, and he healed them all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this chance to be in your word this morning. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would be moving here today. Holy Spirit, speak through me the words that you have for us. Convict even this sinner's heart. God, and Holy Spirit, I ask you would move in our lives. Move us out of the places we get too comfortable. Move us onto your mission. Transform us. Help us be different people today when we leave than the people we came in as. Yeah. Help us hear your word and actually hear and listen to it. Let it actually get into our soul. Yeah. God, we praise you. You are a great God. A holy and mighty God so majestic. We need you. We're lost without you. It is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior's name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Besides the Bible, what's the most important book a Christian can have? Um, the Bible. <laughs> That's a good one. Besides the Bible, what is it? Now, maybe some of you have different answers in this room. Maybe you've never thought about it before. Maybe your attitude's been, well, I have the Bible. Why do I need anything else? That's a good attitude, I suppose. But I want to give you my answer. Besides the Bible, the most important book I believe a Christian can have is this one right here. It's called The Cost of Discipleship. It's by someone who I quote, quite frequently, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I was rereading a lot of it this week. Um, the Cost of Discipleship, it's an interesting title too, because you and I don't often talk about what the cost is of being a disciple of Jesus. What is the cost, if we think about it? Because the Bible tells us that we are to count the cost in order to become Jesus' disciple. So what is that cost? Well, I think this comes down to, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer explains in his book, an understanding of what is this grace that has been given to us. And he makes a comparison, as you will, more of a contrast, I should say, between <laughs> cheap grace and costly grace. Cheap grace is the kind of grace that 
gets handed out as if it were worth nothing. So many churches say, come as you are, receive this grace, and keep your lives exactly how they are. Costly grace is the kind of grace that understands that you were bought with a price. And that price was a high price indeed. It was the price of Jesus Christ's life. And if you are bought with the price, and you understand that how much God paid for you, then doesn't it make sense for grace to cost you something as well? Not that you can ever earn grace, and I don't want you to mishear me on this. You can't earn grace, but when you realize it's been given to you, what does that demand of you? What does grace demand of you when you realize how costly it was? This is a topic that I think comes down to the core of all of us who want to be Christians. Because there's a, a myth and a rumor that we need to dispel. There's a myth that you can be a Christian without becoming a disciple. And that's just not true. Unfortunately, this was something that happened during the medieval age of the church where people realized that the kind of life Jesus called people to was not an easy life to live. They looked at the kind of things that Jesus said, this is how your life will be. They saw the high cost of actually following him. And then what did they do? They decided to make two levels of Christian. You had the clergy and the expert Christians, the monks, and then you have the lay people Christians. And that's what the medieval church did so that they could say, well, see, really the only people who have to be disciples are those higher class Christians. But that's just not true. Come on, Pastor. The cost is for every Christian. Yes, 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 yes. Discipleship is for every Christian. That's not for the monks. That's not for the experts. And so we need to count the cost of discipleship. If we want to follow Jesus. We're looking at a section here in Luke which is all about discipleship. We start off with Jesus calling the 12 disciples who would follow him throughout his earthly ministry. And these disciples who, it says here, became apostles are the ones he would send out and change the world forever. And they were to go and make more disciples. And that's what they were called to do. And later on, we get into these Beatitudes that Luke gives us. And what we're going to discover today is these Beatitudes are all about what distinguishes a disciple from someone else. What shows what it means to be a disciple. Starting back in verse 12, we see this. It says, In these days Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. This is how Jesus begins before picking his twelve disciples. And then he calls the twelve, and you and I both uh, have read the list of the twelve. I, I, we probably don't know these names nearly as well as we do Sam causes reindeers, but <laughs> nonetheless, this is a, a list worth noting because these 12 minus 1 would go on to change the face of the entire earth. In a sense, the other one did too, but not in the right sense. But what I will say is, what's interesting to note is that Jesus when he was picking the leaders of who would take his mission, his kingdom, all out across the world to the ends of the earth, he picks it after a night of prayer. Mm -hmm. He spends all night in prayer. When is the last time you spent all night in prayer? Yeah, Jesus picks them after this night. And it shows you something I think interesting, which is how seriously Jesus took this decision for these people. 
knowing what their mission would be, knowing what this mission would cost them for most of them their lives. In a sense, for all of them, their lives. But we'll talk about that in a little bit, how it doesn't always look the same. What I will say is, when we pick leaders, do we spend this much time in prayer? It's just mm -hmm. worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. What traits do we pick? And here's another interesting thing about this list. This is not who I think any of us would have picked. Mm -hmm. If you look closely at the list, you have a bunch of fishermen. You have Matthew, who was a tax collector. Mm -hmm. You have all sorts of kind of nobodies in that day and age that make up this list. A zealot here. I mean, we have, what we have here is uh, really, they're, 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 they're people that no one would pick if you were gonna start a religious movement. In fact, logically speaking, I think if you and I were picking the 12 disciples, you know, what would we do? We would try and go to the top people who are religious leaders of that day and age. We'd go right to the synagogue, find the top Pharisees or something of that nature, and because we would want to look and try and pick the most qualified. But there's a truth here I think you and I miss, which is no one is truly qualified for this. You can't be qualified for what this is, what the mission Jesus has because this is the mission it has nothing to do with your qualifications <laughs> if you become a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. This mission is all about what God is going to do through you. Therefore, it has nothing to do with any merit of your own that you bring to the table. <laughs> we need to understand that because that was true of his disciples back then, and that's true of his disciples today, that if God has called you on a mission, it's not because of you and how great you are and how qualified you are. Come on. It's because of who he is yeah. and what he will do through you. Yeah. We get to verse 17. He's called these 12, and it says that they came and stood on a level place. And we're going to talk about this, but a great multitude start gathering to him here. And, and he starts healing them and casting out demons. And this all is becoming a precursor for something much greater about to happen. See, he, all these people coming to get healed and whatnot, they're coming to experience his power. What they're going to get is a sermon like no other sermon. Mm -hmm. Many Bibles actually will call what we're about to see in Luke the Sermon on the Plain. No. You all have heard of the Sermon on the Mount, yeah? Yeah. And here, this one they call the Sermon on the Plain. I want to let you in on a scholarly secret. They're the same sermon. <laughs> in fact, some of you are like, no, no, no. I've heard that these are two separate sermons that have very similar messages. That's not true. Where did that come from? That came from one specific thing. The words in some of your Bibles might say, and he came down with them and stood on a plane. Uh, the KJB, King James Bible, I know has that translation. The word for plane there in Greek is toru pedinu. And what does that word actually mean? Level place. This doesn't take place on a different location. This sermon even acknowledges they were in the mountains. What did they do? They found a level place in the mountains for Jesus to preach a sermon. What you and I might call that is a plateau. Come on. It's still in the mountains. It's still a sermon on the mount, but it's on a flat top of a mountainside. This is important. Because when we recognize that this sermon is the same as the Sermon on the Mount, we get to see the Sermon on the Mount from a new perspective. The Sermon on the Mount, if you look up lists of the greatest speeches ever given, almost every time without fail, Sermon on the Mount will appear on that list. <clears throat> and what we have here does look a little bit different than the Sermon on the Mount. And why is that? <clears throat> Well, we have a few reasons for this. 
First off, and this is, an, I think, important to note, the Sermon on the Mount versus what they call the Sermon on the Plain, they were written by different authors. Whoa. Who wrote the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew. Matthew, who was listed here in the 12th. He was an eyewitness, and he his, wrote his letter to Jews specifically, Jewish Christians. His entire gospel, the gospel of Matthew, has a Jewish audience in mind. Luke, on the other hand, he is a, the Gentile uh, writer of the four Gospels, mm -hmm. and he is writing to Theophilus, right. a Gentile audience, right. trying to give an a orderly account. So not only are the people who wrote it different, but what they would try and emphasize to their audiences are different things. <clears throat> so why aren't these two sermons perfectly in sync? I think for good reasons. One, most scholars agree when you study the context of the Sermon on the Mount, it's very likely what we have in our Bibles is not the full sermon. What we have in our Bibles is the highlights of a much bigger sermon. Most scholars actually think this didn't even take place over a few hours, but possibly a few days of teaching. You think my sermons are long. <laughs> but no, what it seems to be the case is Jesus sat down for a few days for teaching on the mountain. This would have been... I'm sure an extremely powerful time. Well, you can't record everything, so you are going to record highlights. And the highlights you recorded your book, if you were one of these gospel writers, would vary depend on what stuck out to you and what you think your audience needs to know from this sermon. Mm -hmm. That's good. So Luke, he admits a lot of the stuff that has to do with the Jewish law and how Jesus was updating the Jewish laws from the Old Testament. He leaves out a lot of the Jewish bent material because he's writing to a Gentile audience who wouldn't have known those things. Versus on Matthew, he is trying to show how Jesus is the Jewish Messiah come to give the kingdom. And from that, we would get differences. The other thing you notice is these sermons don't contradict one another. They actually often complement one another. When one leaves off, another one picks up. And it actually is really cool because we get more of the full picture that way. For example, we're about to study what's called the Beatitudes. Well, Luke doesn't include all of the Beatitudes. And Matthew doesn't include the woes. Yet, they don't contradict one another. Matthew includes more of the Beatitudes, so we get more of that picture. Well, Luke includes the woes that Matthew leaves off, and they work together. So there's that difference that's worth noting. The other thing you need to understand is what language is this sermon originally given in? Aramaic. Jesus and his disciples spoke in Aramaic. It was the common tongue of that place in that day. It's only later when the gospel writers are writing down events that this would be translated into Greek, which was the common tongue for everyone, so that they would be able to experience the story of Jesus. What, why does this make a difference? Because just like translators of our Bible today, if you're translating from one language into another, there's different translating styles that can take place. Right. We've talked about in uh, some of my extra studies, whether it's in one of my classes or Sunday school, that, for example, this ESV is a word-for-word -word translation. Mm -hmm. The NIV is more of a phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation. And they do different things. A word-for-word -word tries to match the best, closest word. A phrase-for-phrase -phrase tries to match the closest idea from one section to the next part. If you actually study these two sections side by side, it seems like Luke is giving more of a word for word, while Matthew is giving more of a phrase for phrase of their Aramaic translations into the Greek. And we're going to see that. <clears throat> Why does all this matter? This matters because here we may have the most important sermon ever given. The most important message that you could ever hear. And we want to make sure 
that when we're coming into this, we're, we're ready to hear and receive what it has. And to be ready, I think we need to have this background knowledge and information ready for us. So what's happening here? One thing we need to note is that the other thing people get wrong as we're about to dive into this section, it, it, it comes in verse 20 of Luke. So look down at verse 20 really quick. And he lifted his eyes on his disciples and said. Did you all see that? Yeah. Who is Jesus' primary audience? Disciples. The disciples. Jesus is surrounded by a multitude of people, a large crowd who knows how large. And they're about to all witness the greatest message ever given. And yet he's not even addressing the majority of them. He's just addressing the disciples. And other people are listening in, mind you. But this, the greatest message of all time, is written to people who are already Jesus' disciples. So that's one more thing you need to understand going into the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon is not how you become a disciple. This sermon is not about how to enter in to the kingdom of heaven. This is a sermon to the people who are already supposed to be in it. Yes. Now there are people who are looking in from the outside, the crowds, the multitudes, and what they are getting is they are getting an outside peek at what life in the kingdom is supposed to look like. That's important for us. And it's important because if you and I call ourselves Christians, the Sermon on the Mount is supposed to, it's designed to show us the way that you and I ought to be living if we're Jesus' disciples. And it also comes with a warning, if you will, if these things aren't true of you, you might not be one of his disciples. I'm going to jump forward into the sermon to read just two verses, because I think that'll put all of this into perspective. In verse 43 of Luke chapter 6, Jesus says this, and I think this is really his, really, I think it's his big idea for the whole sermon. For no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. What is this about? This is about what kind of tree you are. Mm -hmm. What kind of tree are you? If, for example, if I go out into my backyard to pick an apple from one of those trees, I'm going to be in trouble. Because I have pine trees in my backyard. <laughs> and I can spend all day long outside looking for apples on my trees. And I will find no apples on those trees. Does that make sense to you? You know what I will find on my trees? Pine cones. Pine needles. You know a tree by its fruits. This is the big idea of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is important to us because... If we are disciples of Jesus, we will have certain fruits in our lives. And you will know if we're to his disciples if those fruits exist in our lives. And if a different fruit is in our lives, it means we're not his disciples. And I want to say, you know, a lot of people I think... They, they get confused. They try to m make fruit appear that fits what the disciples would have. 
And the, the equivalent I can think of is, what would it be like if I said, Laura, let me go get you an apple from the trees outside? She says, Josh, we have pine trees. Don't be ridiculous. I said, no, don't worry about this. I got this. And I pulled out a basket of apples I brought from, bought from the store. And I go outside with a staple gun, start stapling the apples to the trees. Now I have apple trees, right? Are you sure? So you're telling me next year when I come back to those trees, I won't have apples? Yeah, I think that's so supposed to be obvious. But here's the thing is, while we see that as obvious, we don't realize that too often you and I, we try and staple the fruits of being a Christian onto a tree that's not a Christian tree. This is something we need to be worried about. So as we get into it, as we get into it, that's what these Beatitudes are all about. The Beatitudes, these are not how to get into heaven. Not, these aren't how to become a disciple. These are the fruits of a disciple. And in Luke, we have the woes. And those are the fruits of someone who's not a disciple. So as we look at this, we're going to see how people will try to staple fruits and call themselves saved when they're not. And it's a word of caution for each of you. I don't know your secret hidden lives. I don't know how many of you are doing this. You're stapling Christian fruit to the outside when you're a pine tree. So you need to examine yourself today. Because that's not something I can do for you. Starting with the first of the Beatitudes. Verse 20, part 2. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. This goes along with the woe from verse 24, which I'm going to read with it. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Now, you need to understand something before we get started. Being poor doesn't make you a disciple. If that was true, then we could try and get heaven, I think, a little too easily. We can make just a bunch of bad economic decisions and then call ourselves disciples. And that's not how it works. Being charitable isn't even how you become a disciple. Uh, for example, some of you will see those Santas ringing the bells. And because you walk by and toss a few coins in, that does not make you a disciple. <clears throat> because you decided to volunteer at a food bank, that does not make you a disciple. We need to understand these blessings. Blessed are you who are poor. What is this saying? This is Christians are known... First off, because they will bear the fruits of poorness. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. You guys are dialed in. There's two important things we need to understand. There's a literal side to this and a spiritual side to this. And we cannot ignore either. This is so important. So if some people want to try and take this verse, they want to and take it out of context. They will come and spout Marxist theologies or liberation theology, and they'll try and say that being poor is how you become righteous, and that's not true. Being a disciple will make you poor. What does that mean? In a very literal sense, think about this group that Jesus has called, the 12 disciples. They are sitting in this crowd. They have left everything to follow him. They have left their nets in their boats. They have left their tax tables. They have left their families. <clears throat> they have left everything. They have nothing left in the world other than Jesus, these 12 who he's called. They are the poorest of the poor in this very moment. And being a disciple, one of your fruits is that you may be very poor. And here's why I say that there's a literal side to this. Disciples 
They have made their master on this earth, not their wallets, but Jesus. And if Jesus is your master, you know what's going to happen to your wallet? It's going to get a lot smaller. Why? Because you are going to be giving away until it hurts. Whenever you see a need, you won't be able to help yourself from giving to that need. When other people, they are trying to get ahead and they're taking the shortcuts and they're cheating other people out of money. As a Christian, because Jesus is your master, you aren't taking shortcuts. You are being greedy. And what's the consequence? Your wallet's going to get a lot thinner. That's a fruit of being a disciple. It's also a cost that we need to count when we're considering discipleship. You will literally be poor because you won't stop being able to give things away. It says, woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation. On the other side, I see so many Christians, especially in this country. We are so blessed in this country. But man, has our money become an idol for some of us. They will try and say something like, I'm not hoarding my wealth. I'm being a good steward. A good steward gives what God has given to them. A good steward understands that God blesses them so they can bless others. You hoarding something for yourself is not being a good steward. You're all the time building up bigger barns, not realizing that there is a day coming when God will show up and demand your soul. And all this time that you've spent worshiping your wallet, well, I hope you enjoyed it because this is you've received your consolation. That's all you're getting. Wow. Woe to you who are rich. Now, there's a spiritual side to this too, and I don't want to miss it. Luke says, Blessed are the poor. He's doing probably very word for word of the Aramaic into the Greek. Matthew says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because there is a connotation, a spiritual connotation, to the way that Jesus worded this in the Aramaic that we shouldn't ignore. It's not just about economic status, it doesn't exclude economics. But it's not just about economics. How do I know this? Psalm 40, verse 17. I will go there very quickly. The psalmist cries out to God, and he says this. As for me, I am poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Who is that psalmist? That's a psalm of David. In case you aren't really familiar with your Israeli history, David was a king. You couldn't call David economically poor or needy. So what does David mean? Good, that's good. David, when he says, I am poor and needy, he, he is saying, I am contrite and lowly in spirit. I am humbled and totally reliant on you, God. It. It's a recognition that there is nothing I have that I can give. I am totally, desperately in need of you, Lord. A disciple, while they might be literally poor, they will also certainly bear fruit where they are utterly reliant on God because they realize there is nothing in themselves worth any merit or value. It is all because of God's grace that they are saved. God's grace is the only reason I'm saved. It's the only reason that anyone from the history of the world till now has been saved. Paul the Apostle was saved by God's grace the same way I am. Blessed are the poor. They understand how desperately they need God. The ones who are rich, they're the ones who are, they think they've got it. Yes. They have things under control. They aren't reliant on God because they did it themselves. They pulled themselves up by the bootstrap uh -oh. and they've made it happen. Uh -oh. You know what? I hope they enjoy the short few years they have here because that's all they're going to get. The next fruit 
in, in verse 21, it says, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who are hungry. Christians, once again, I think there's a literal way to understand this and a spiritual way, and I don't want to neglect either. In a very literal sense, if you're poor, you might become very hungry. There was a, a, a recently I heard about a missionary organization here in the United States. And I was listening to someone talk to me about this. This is an organization that their big goal was to try and support missionaries around the world. And the people in the United States who worked for this missionary organization full time, they had gone through a period where they hadn't had a paycheck in two months. Because every cent that came through their door, they were sending out to the missionaries throughout the world. And those missionaries weren't getting by by much either. It was a very desperate situation. They were giving so much that they were going hungry themselves. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are you if you are a disciple and you have that fruit. I think, in a sense, this is one area that you and I maybe have the hardest time relating to because not many of us go hungry often. I mean, I clearly don't go hungry often. This is probably an area I need to work on myself. You know, if all the entire U.S. shut down today, and let's say all the grocery stores were closed, most of us could probably live off of what we have in our pantry for what, six months or a year, mm -hmm. along with our multiple refrigerators. Mm -hmm. We are a country surrounded by abundance to the point where we don't even understand hunger. We're but coming up on a celebration of food. Isn't it that the case this coming week? <laughs> and I, I just want you to be careful that you do not make food an idol. Mm -hmm. You are not going to celebrate Thanksgiving to worship your food. There is great, it's great to have food in order to celebrate, but if you are worshiping your food, that's a dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual side to this hunger as well. Amos 11.13, if uh, you have a Bible, feel free to turn there with me. Um, if not, then, you know, I'll, I'll read it out loud and you can read my lips. <laughs> so, Amos 8, 11 through 13 says this, Behold, the days are coming declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Mm. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. But they shall not find it. In that day, the lovely virgins and the young men shall faint for thirst. There is a greater hunger we need to be aware of. Disciples are hungry for God and his word. Yeah, true yeah. disciples, that is part of the fruit. A true disciple of Jesus, if you go more than a day without being in the Holy Scriptures, you'll start to feel it. Mm -hmm. You'll feel your, your spiritual self start to die and waste away. Because a true disciple of Jesus, they hunger for the words of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Just like you and I would hunger for food if we didn't have so much. In the same way that we, if you miss a meal, would feel start to feel faint. A Christian who hungers for the God, if they miss reading in the Bible that day, they start to grow faint. If they miss their morning time to pray with the Lord or evening time to pray with the Lord, they will grow faint because they miss the Lord so badly. It was a week and a half ago, I was talking on the phone with JP, and he said, I haven't been to church in a while, and, I, I, I'm, and this is his words, and he, he said, I'm hungry for the fellowship there. Mm -hmm. If you miss 
too much time away from being in fellowship with God's people, you ought to grow hungry. You ought to be so desperately starving for fellowship with God's people that you will not miss a Sunday here as long as you can help it. Amen. Because you hunger for God's, the people that God has put in your life, God's community of saints that he has set up. You hunger for the word of the Lord. You hunger for him. And you thirst for for his kingdom to come. You look at the world and you desire God's kingdom because you see how desperately this world needs him right now. Mm -hmm. Blessed are you who are hungry, mm -hmm. for you shall be satisfied. There is a day coming when you will be satisfied. Mm -hmm. There is a day coming when God is going to throw the most grand and marvelous banquet there ever was. None of the people who are physically hungry, who are of him, will be hungry on that day. None of us who are spiritually hungry for him will be hungry on that day. We will be satisfied. That's what's in our future. But it goes with the woe in verse 25. Verse 25. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. See, the people who are full now, these people, either they've, in a very literal sense, filled their lives up with food and comforts, and in a spiritual sense, they've also become comfortably numb in this world. They are satisfied with the way things are. They don't hunger to grow in righteousness. Mm -hmm. They're fine how they are. They don't need to keep trying harder, going to church more, trying to get a deeper relationship with God. They don't actually want to have their character grow and change because they're fine. They're comfortable. They're satisfied. They live in a satisfying way in their satisfied lives. And, you know, what does it say? These people... They're going to be hungry. There's going to be a day when the trees that bear this bad fruit are going to hell and they'll never be satisfied again. We cannot take lightly this. There's a cost to being a disciple. You will be poor. Either physically, spiritually, probably both. You will be hungry. Physically, spiritually, probably both. There's a cost to following him. But I want you to understand, there's a greater cost not to. Mm -hmm. We'll go on. Part 2 of verse 21, part B, if you will. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you who weep. Now, what kind of weeping is this talking about? This is not talking about any sadness counts as weeping. There are so many people who aren't the disciples of Jesus who weep. Weeping for them is not a sign that they're saved. No, this is specifically referring to weeping over sin. If we look for a moment at the largest chapter in the Bible, Psalms 119, in verse 136, this is what the psalmist cries out. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses, verse 21, Paul shares this with the Corinthian church. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and who have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. Does sin break your heart? I will tell you this is one thing I see over and over again. The closer you are to God, the more sin should break your heart. The more knowledge you have of the holy, the more you should look at yourself and see how far away you are. And that more it should break your heart to not be with him like you should be. 
That's just how it is. If sin doesn't break your heart when it shows up in your life, it's because you become too cold-hearted, too stone-hearted. You become too used to it. You've adjusted to it, and your conscience has grown dull. Wake up, I urge you. Let sin break your heart. And not just your sin, but the sin around you should break your heart. The sin of your brothers and sisters in Christ the sin of this world. When you turn on the news and you see people parading around and celebrating things like the LGBTQ, you should have your heart break because of how lost they are. It should break your heart to see so many people so confused about their gender when it's something that God has biologically built into them. That's right. Amen. It should break your heart when you hear of rapes, drug trafficking, prostitution, abortions. abortions, exactly. These things ought to break your heart because of how many lost and confused people are walking away from the light, stumbling upon themselves in the darkness. Mm -hmm. You should mourn and weep for them. A true disciple of Jesus will look around at this world and one of the fruits of being a true disciple is it will break your heart to see people who could have the light and yet who stumble in darkness. That's a fruit of being a disciple of Jesus. On the other side, verse 25b, it says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Now, this isn't laughing like if you turn on a sitcom and it's really funny, you shouldn't, you know, enjoy the humor. Jesus isn't that much of a killjoy. Calm down. No, this is those who laugh at God's ways and mock him. Those who celebrate their sin, flaunt it for everyone to see. Those who mock the Christ who died on their behalf. These are the people who laugh and they amuse themselves all day long, not worrying about how vile and nasty of a sin and the life that they're living in. And there's a day coming, according to this verse, where they shall mourn and weep. When they go to hell, there will be nothing worth laughing about there. That's true. They will mourn for all eternity and weep. This is a real weight we have to understand. It's a fruit of the bad tree. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to be honest. It, it costs you something to weep and mourn now. A lot of, I think a lot of Christians, they get in the habit of wanting to turn the other way. This world's so bad, I'm just going to ignore it and do my own Christian thing. They want to become their own versions of monks or something where they turn the other way from the pain and suffering in this world. They turn off the news. They stop engaging in this world because... They just don't want to see all that sad stuff, and they'd rather be happy and amused with their television programs or their movies. And they just block out all of that. And I don't want to tell you if that's you, you don't have the fruit of mourning and weeping. Examine yourself. Yeah, it costs you something to care about the world. It's not fun to have to weep over the sins of this world. But it will cost you so much more if you do not. We get on to this verse 22. This is a little bit of a longer one, so stick in there, though. Blessed are you when people hate you. When they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. The woe that goes with this is this. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. We need to understand something here. If you are going to follow Jesus, if you are going to make a stand behind Jesus, if you're going to obey Jesus and be his disciple, 
you will be persecuted for it. People will hate you. That's how this works. Now, some Christians, especially in this country, they, well, they act in ways that are very unchristlike, and then they say that the world's persecuting them. There is a, a satire known as the Gospel Blimp satire, and told the story of this small town where there's a group of Christians who got together and got a blimp to fly around the small town, and it would have you know Bible verses streaming off the back of the blimp, and day and night they would drop from their blimp these uh, various uh, pamphlets or sermons or whatnot all over the yards of the neighbors in the small town. You can see how pretty soon this was going to become obnoxious. Finally, the last straw came when they installed a giant PA speaker system where they would non-stop blast <laughs> the town with their gospel <laughs> message. <coughs> Even at all hours of the night. Well, eventually, after that straw, the newspaper put out this editorial talking about how this town has put up with this for long enough. And it's unfair for these Christians to be proselytizing this town so viciously. And the story goes on that that night the gospel blimp became sabotaged. And one of the Christians who had it say, we're being persecuted. Being persecuted for Jesus isn't, being per, uh, isn't the same as being persecuted because you're a horse's rump. I'm sorry. Being persecuted for Jesus is being persecuted because you walk in the ways of Jesus. Not because you are aggressive and in people's face. Not because you're picketing funerals and yelling at people. That's not being persecuted for Jesus when people retaliate. Being persecuted for Jesus is when you stand up for the truth, no matter what it will do to you, and having people hate you because of it. Yeah. In John, I know I'm everywhere today, but All right. <laughs> in John 15, Jesus says something I think is so relevant to this. <clears throat> he starts in verse 18. If the world hates you, know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. This is important for us to keep in mind. Because here's the woe. If in your life you honestly don't think that you're persecuted ever, no one has anything bad to say about you, especially at least concerning your faith in Jesus Christ, if no one has a bad word to say about you, it's because you're probably not following Jesus very closely. If you're following Jesus closely, because they persecuted him, they'll persecute you. Because Jesus was a light that made people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you were a light like Jesus is, you're going to make people uncomfortable by being near them. Right. When is the last time you were excluded from an event because you were a Christian? From a family event or a friend's event? If you haven't been, I would argue it's because you probably, you're making a sacrifice somewhere. In the truth. You're not actually following him like you should. I think so much of some of these big televangelist style preachers who they don't want to say anything offensive any of the time. Because they're so concerned with what people think. They don't even preach sin or hell anymore. They, they, they don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. They just want everyone to have their best life now. And let me tell you, those people... They're just like these false prophets. And maybe you are too. If you're not living closely following Jesus, if you're not being persecuted, that's a fruit that you should have if you are on the if you are a disciple, if you are the right kind of tree. Mm 
If you don't have that fruit, you should examine your life. You should examine your life. Because when it comes down to all of this, what kind of tree you are, that determines everything. I want to re-emphasize a few things. Doing these things does not make you a disciple. Going out, becoming poor, starving yourself. If you decide to go out and mourn a bunch, if you go out and try and find ways for you to get persecuted, those things don't make you a disciple. Jesus isn't teaching people how to become disciples. He's teaching people, if you are my disciples, here's how you tell these are the features that distinguish you. These are the fruits you were to bear if you were a good tree. If you are bearing the other kinds of fruits, if you're bearing pine cones, it's because you're a pine tree. If you're bearing the woes, it's because you're not of his. his. And I think some of you need to hear this not just for yourself, but also because some of you have family. Some of you have children, siblings, parents, spouses that you're in denial about. Because all their life, if you look at their life, all anyone can see is pine cones, and yet you keep calling them saved. And that's not what Jesus teaches here. There's a way to discern whether or not you were a disciple, and by the kind of fruit you bear. And we don't help people by lying to people about what kind of tree they are. We don't. You walk up to someone and tell them they're an apple tree, even though they only see pine cones, and you keep telling them, no, no, you're an apple tree. You're just a straying apple tree. You're, you're, a, you're a carnal apple tree. You're lying to them, and that's not helping anyone. And you might be lying to yourself, too, if you are the type of person who's trying to tack apples onto pine trees. You, you figure, well, I'm not being a disciple enough, so I'm going to go out and be poor or hungry, and I'll just try and stack that onto my life. That's not how this works. You become a disciple, and Jesus makes you bear those fruit. Mm, that's, right. that's how this works. Mm -hmm. This is not something you add to yourself. This is something you get because you're walking the ways of the Holy Spirit, following Jesus, giving everything to Jesus. I asked you what the cost of discipleship is. It's everything. It cost Jesus his life to save you. It cost your life to follow him. Now, you get it unmerited of your efforts and works, but it costs you everything. You need to understand that. You can't earn it by how good you are, but if you want to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you everything. That's why I don't do altar calls where you come up and say a prayer and I call you saved. Because that's not how you get saved, by saying a certain prayer. Right. You get saved by giving your life to Jesus and following him. And obeying him. You get saved when you decide that because he's given his life to you, you will give everything in your life back to him and follow him the rest of your life. And even if it costs you, even if it means you will be poor, you will be hungry, you will mourn, and you will be persecuted, even if it costs you those things, you say, I don't care. I'm all in. You have my life. And you have it to do with as you please. Whatever the cost. That's what we're talking about here. And yeah, the cost of discipleship, it's something we need to count. Even before we become disciples, we should consider, am I ready to give him everything? But I want to tell you what this passage really affirms is the cost of discipleship might be high. The cost of not following him is far, far higher. Amen. That's something for us to consider. I want to kind of share with you something from here. Um, but I'm actually going to share it with you out of my quote book. But this is the book I told you I think is the most important book, in my opinion, outside the Bible for every Christian to have. The Cost of Discipleship by Diedrich Bonhoeffer. I want to tell you a little bit about Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a German pastor, and he was pastoring 
during the rise of Hitler in Nazi Germany. And he was one of the few people from the very beginning who, because of his Christian beliefs, were standing up against Hitler. All these churches around Germany, they kept making compromises so that they can stay in favor with the Nazi power, but he would not do it. And he goes away to America for a while because of the persecution, but then he realizes, you know what? I need to go back and be with the people who are going to be persecuted. And even though he could have stayed in America safe and lived out a long and happy life there, he says, I need to be with the people who are being persecuted, with those Christians. He gets one of the last boats back to Germany. He gets back to Germany just in time for World War II to happen. He ends up having to run an underground seminary for a while. Eventually, he gets arrested and put into a concentration camp because of his Christian faith. He ends up at Flossenburg concentration camp. And on in April of 1945, Heinrich Himmler orders his execution. And when the People come to grab Bonhoeffer in order to take him away. You know the thing he was doing? He was just finishing up preaching a Sunday morning service to those who were in that concentration camp. Keeping their hopes going for Jesus. He ends up dying a few days before Flossenburg concentration camp would have been liberated. As I was reading through this book this week, I, I, I took out a quote that it really hit me. Here's a man who gave everything, his whole life to follow Jesus. And here's what something he says, and I think you'll see why it, it hit me so hard. In the kingdom of heaven, there shall be, there the, sh the sorry, in the kingdom of heaven, there shall the poor be seen in the halls of joy. With his own hands, God wipes away the tears from the eyes of those who have mourned upon this earth. He feeds the hungry at his banquet. There stands the scarred bodies of the martyrs, now glorified and clothed in white robes of eternal righteousness, instead of the rags of sin and repentance. In a Another, another section, he, he goes on and says this other quote that I, I, I can't leave out because of what it, I, it means. Um, sorry, give me one second. I had it highlighted, but my notes are not in the order I want them to be. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Sam. I appreciate your guys' patience. I had this quote lined up and I wanted to share it as well, and I've just, uh, I lost the spot where I wanted to share it from, unfortunately. What I will say is, uh, actually, I can uh, find it actually quicker in here, sorry. For every man, even disciples themselves, belongs to the rich ones of whom it is so difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven. The answer gives, Jesus gives, shows 
that the disciples understood him. Salvation through following Jesus is not something we men can achieve for ourselves, but with God, all things are possible. Discipleship is not limited to what you can comprehend. It must transcend all comprehension. Not the work which you choose, not the suffering you devise, but the road which is clean and contrary to all you choose or contrive or desire. That is the road you must take. Yeah. That To that I call you, and to that you must be Jesus' disciple. If you do that, there is an acceptable time, and there your master has come. Yeah. I wanted to share with you this, and why this really impacted me is because Bonhoeffer was not the kind of guy who wrote these high platitudes and didn't live them out. He writes about the scarred bodies of the martyrs before becoming one himself. He is an example of someone who bears the fruits. And now you need to ask yourself, do I? Do I bear the fruits? If you want to talk more about this, uh, I encourage you, find me. We'll find a time to sit down and talk, and talk about this. But examine your lives. Make sure you know which kind of tree you are based on what fruit you have. Let's go somewhere. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be able to use any words that were shared here today for your glory, for your kingdom, for upbuilding your people. For those of you... For those of you in this room, God, I, I ask that you would touch their lives. God, I, I pray that the people here today would take seriously what your word has to say. I pray that these people here today would be able to connect with this most important sermon that Jesus gave. God, I... I humbly acknowledge that you are God, you are king above all. We have nothing we can bring to this. It is by your grace we are saved. An unmerited gift that costs you the life of Jesus. And I pray that you help each and every one of us be willing to give our lives back to you. Mm, yes, Lord. Move us today. Mm. Change us today. Be with us as we pray these things.